capital investments that are needed to bring the building up, you know, and, and, and then the mission stuff we talked about, is it the city's mission to be a landlord and to, to rent property? Um, yeah, and I was trying to figure out what are the bigger drivers here. Clearly it wasn't to generate what to, we thought that we had a real diamond in the rough that we could flip and make a lots and lots of money or something. Mm -hmm. That was never the illusion that we were functioning under. Mm -hmm. Susan, can I ask you, uh, and this is actually ancillary to what we're discussing, but the fact that these overvaluations on nonprofit systems, do they go on an inventory where we where we make the claim that we're not collecting this much tax from, I mean, when we say um, mm -hmm. properties are protected under the Dover Amendment or things like that, that we have these insane assessments that, that Council Murphy was talking about, a $3 million assessment on this, and then if we ever make a claim that these, these are revenues that we are not collecting, that we're not capable of collecting, do we ever, is there any particular avenue mm -hmm. that we file with the state on that? Yeah. Yeah. So these are just sort of fantastic numbers that have no relevance to anything on planet Earth. Right. <laughs> right. And I think, I think we use some of them perhaps in our statement of values, which is for our insurer. Okay. Um, but they also have their own formulas about replacement cost and everything. So. I, I don't think it has much bearing on anything that we really work with. I mean, when you hear people advocating and saying that, that because of the Dover Amendment, <coughs> you know, all these exempt properties are, are uh, you know, if, if we had some type of pilot payment over taxes system, it certainly would be based, be based on these numbers that we're seeing here, uh, according to the assessor's office. So. No, you'd have to develop a cost approach. And And if we were to attach a pilot to this, how would we value what that pilot would be? How would that be assessed? In the past, when we've done pilots, uh, we've used, we've used, you know, we've taken averages of values in the city and average tax bills and things like that. When we, when the city sold a parcel near the water department on Prospect Street uh, for use for creation of a of the Solomon Schechter School, mm -hmm. there was a pilot that was derived from sort of a, what the potential generation, tax generation of that building would have been. The same thing on the, the um, pilot agreement mm -hmm. that we have with Smith College in the Green Street area. We, we looked at those income generating properties, uh, what they would, and use a formula had they not been taken off the tax rolls, looking at what a building of that same size and would be generating today. So it's about a, 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 a potential investor in this property isn't looking at a pilot that's based on a $3 million assessment, then they're, they're something much more reasonable. And if, and, and I, let me just read on page 25 what the appraiser, because I was looking around in the report, I knew he didn't do a cost approach and I knew why he didn't, but I do it for a statement of, but at the top of page 25, where he refers to the cost approach. He says the cost approach is not appropriate for an older property, such as the subject where there is a high percentage of physical depreciation and functional obsolescence. Depreciation is difficult to accurately measure in an older building when these levels become very high. As a result, I have not developed this approach, which is sort of what I mentioned earlier. But I knew it somewhere if he didn't use it, if he didn't use an approach, he was supposed to identify why he didn't. And I just hadn't, you know, I knew why he didn't, so I didn't look for where he said it. But he does say it in there. We have, uh, and I was going to say we actually have kind of a recent example of what you're talking about in that. Clark School right. um, just sold, and and that's been one where we've had a number that's been kind of you know generated by a computer, but not really based on anything. Yeah. And I know that in talking in a meeting with the assessors and folks, uh, the purchasers, and I mean what they're basically going to base it on is the sale <coughs> price right. for the first year. Uh, they're going to use the sale price as as what the value of the property is, and then every July one they're going to then look at. What improvements have been made? What gener what income is it generating, et cetera, uh, going forward? In the yes. So, question then: What, what was the, how far was the difference between what they were assessing? What they were I was I don't, I haven't pulled up the Clark School, but I'm assuming it'll be similar to the Cole Morgan example, where you have a site that was you know whatever on I, the market I, for four or five million and it sold for way less. Yeah, I tried to do that today with another sort of anomaly building, I, I went and got the assessed numbers for St. John's Church, St. John Canyon's Church, which is for sale. Um, and it's currently assessed at, the, the 
church and rectory and and hall, uh, function hall, is assessed at a million two, and the parking lot is at, assessed at 120. So basically a million three. And I did attempt to catch up with um, the realtor who's got it for sale to see what they're exactly asking for to see what that relationship would be. Unfortunately, I couldn't track them down this afternoon after I got these numbers to get them to say, well, you know, uh, I got somebody in the office to say, oh yeah, if you offer the bishop a million two, you know it tomorrow. <laughs> but I don't know what they're really asking for, it. and, and uh, yours is a good example too. Um, what, you know, what is the total valuation of all the Clark School buildings relative to what they negotiated? It's going to be substantially different. And again, because for these buildings, the, co the cost approach is really easy uh, for the computer, which is why it gets used, and it's more or less a number that isn't really relevant. But to answer the question, if it sells, what happens? You have a sale price. You'll have a building permit because they'll obviously go out and, and start to make improvements. You know, and we may well end up where Joan is because if you pay 270 for it and you do, you know, David Pomerantz's 1.2, 1.3 million dollars worth of improvements to get it so that it in fact is a stable <coughs> and rentable building, you're going to be right up to 1.4 again, which is where Joan's cost approach has it. So that that may be where it ultimately ends up. But to carry that forward, based on the numbers that we saw here, the, the rents would, was for that kind of cash outlay. I mean, those rents are only at a reasonable rate of return for 270 from what we see. Mm -hmm. So how would, why would anyone well, the, the, the buy big, it unless, unless the, they were going to convert it to a different use? Exactly, which is why these buildings are so hard to market because when you come right down to it, is it economically viable even at two hundred and seventy thousand dollars with a million two or three of required improvements? Is anybody going to do that deal? You know that that's what that's all of a sudden when you start to look at the two hundred and seventy thousand dollar number and say there's some credibility in a number this low because with what the needs of the building are, the substantial improvements it needs, what is its value, and and that. Also, you know, you, you wonder why we, as, as, as the city, look at this and go, why do we really want to own this any longer? Because it's going to take 1.2 or $3 million to make this thing reliable and stable. And we're not in that business. You know, that's why when you look at it, you wind up with $200,000 values for buildings that you think, wow, if this was, if this was up to snuff, it would be worth a million something. But it's not. And a person who's in the business might not go there, but it's the city, that's one of the reasons we're probably not really anxious to do it either, because we're not in the business. And it's a lot of money to, to put into a building that's not outside of our, you know, the nature of our primary activities. Gene? Yeah, and developers are pretty careful also when they buy a piece of property. They know that if it's assessed or if it's appraised or assessed at $250,000 and they pay 500000 for it, when the Department of Revenue does a sales ratio study at the end of the year, and they look and they see that somebody paid twice as much for that piece of property as it's worth, the Department of Revenue gets right on board, and that will automatically raise the assessment more huge, and we see it all the time here in Northampton. Um, I won't get into just exactly which one, but recently we had one that was uh, assessed at $650,000, sold for $1.3 million. And immediately the following year, the Department of Revenue is actually was the catalyst that bumped that uh, assessment up by over 50%, just like that. So the developers are careful about that also. So it, and, and all of this stuff that we talk about brings back, brings right back to where we were, that the building is actually a millstone. And it's tough. It's, it's, it's how much is it worth to a particular person? And, and that's, oh, no, sorry. Once, uh, my line of inquiry is actually focused more on the fact that the tenants have expressed a possible interest in trying to get together and, 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 and invest in this, and I, I want to give them a fairly clear sense of what, what the potential is and what, what the possible liabilities are. So rather than speak in terms, I mean, I think it's appropriate to speak in terms of the developer, but I also think at the same time, given the fact that there is a value that isn't assessed by any assessor, that isn't assessed by uh, any number cruncher, it's the value that's that's contributed that the tenants spoke so eloquently about last time, which is the value to the community as a, an 
incubator site for development of small businesses and artists and portable space, maybe even work live space. So to that end, I was wondering if we could talk about it in that light, just just for purposes of the discussion and possibly so everyone has a clearer sense about what the prospects are. So um, th as, that's why I was asking, is this, this $270,000 assessment based roughly on the price that we're projecting out that we're going to be listing this at? And, and I understand your answer is no, not necessarily. And, uh, well, I would think that probably what we would do is, uh, you know, if, depending on what, what, what the decision was, we would request a proposal. You know, you'd want to request proposals for people who would come forward and make a pitch and, and say this is what I this is what I or we would like to do with the building and this is what we're willing to pay for it and this you know that would be yeah, could you lay out a, 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 the process for folks who are interested that what, what that would involve doing an RFP? Uh, how would they present it? What would they draft well, but I think what we, I think what we first have to reach the conclusion of and that's part of the reason for this committee would be that the city, the school has surplused it from its inventory, saying we no longer want it for a school use, and that then it automatically flips to the city. We'd have to make a decision that the, that the council would have to decide that we find this to be, sur, you know, we're surplusing it from the city's inventory, and we're going to then issue an RFP. We would issue a request for proposals, or I mean, you could put it, you could hire a broker and put it on the market. You could do an auction. Probably what we'd want to do, given the sensitivity of this building and wanting to make sure whatever the end use is fits in with the neighborhood, that we would probably do some kind of an RFP process, and we would ask people to. We'd have to develop an RFP, and then we'd put it out there for the public, and we'd ask people to submit proposals. Um, and, and that RFP. And it certainly could say that special consideration would be given to bidders that have this vision for the building. You exactly. know, live yeah. workspace, yeah. small incubator business space. Yeah. And nothing would preclude the owners from forming an association and submitting an RFP under those terms. Um, and there's no way to tell uh, where, what kind of offers would actually come. And we've got some sort of ballpark about what an appraiser thinks. but. You form the RFP, you say you're giving consideration to uses that are consistent with what's going on there now and see what you get. Um, as a, Certainly as a, as a first step, it doesn't preclude an owner's association or anyone. You know, and the other thing a possible developer looks at is what else could be done with that site. And it has frontage on Pine, it has frontage um, around the corner. And it may be that if you did the analysis, you could actually put another structure on there um, that didn't front on Pine Street. and, and a developer might say, well, I can redo this building, but I could also put another building over here because I have adequate parking and, uh, and, and profit to a greater extent. Or perhaps they say, we'll rent the first floor, but we'll have live workspaces on the second floor that we sell as condos that will generate more money immediately to offset the building. So we'll rent the first floor and condo the second floor to live work artists. And, you know, so it could be any number of ways to respond to an RFP. But the, but the process would be we'd first have to get to that point where we were actually putting something like that together. And, and uh, Mass General Law have any restrictions on who we sell it to or what entity we sell it to? <coughs> I know I know when we did the RFP for the biker school, which was not to sell it but to rent it, we were so specific in that RFP as to say we wanted it to rent to an entity that was going to be vacant. Yeah. So you, like we the did the survival center at the water right. yeah. on at Prospect mm -hmm. Street and the yeah. music center we did the same but thing. Yeah. You couldn't draft an RFP that would literally indicate a buyer no. uh, with a particular project. That would be the equivalent of spot zone. Yeah. 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 Right. So <laughs> in this case I think it would be interesting to see, you know, who you know were you know, could the tenants form an association and put a number together that would work? You know, you let the market sort of be creative to see who looks at it and comes up with the best idea for it. But you probably would want to be, you know, payment in lieu of taxes specific. You probably want to be, you know, you'd like to see these uses be in the building and they get consideration. But it might be interesting to see exactly what clever and creative people come up with and propose for it. Because what we're looking at, the bottom line, if we eliminate the 270 we're still looking at a million two just to fit it 
just to conform, uh, that, uh, David's recommendation, I believe David, is, is just to bring it up to essentially an efficient and up to code. Never mind the fact that you're converting to live workspace and there's all the additional electrical and plumbing work that would be required. There would also be another significant expense and investment. So he's just, I, I think it's important that everyone understands as they consider these things what what's at stake or what's involved. Yeah, and it would be, you would handle it totally differently. If you're going to do live workspaces on the second floor, they'd all have individual heating systems. So if you were doing, and you're going to rent the first floor, you might do the same thing there. You might heat the first floor from the basement with one main heating system, but the upstairs would all be paid individually. I mean, you know, any number of different ways to approach it. You do that, it, you know, reduces your, you got a $42,000 heating bill there. You can disperse that amongst the tenants. That changes your, your math considerably. But the fact remains that I, I think to the concern of the tenants who are there right now that the rents that they're enjoying now and the prospects of the space and stuff that they're enjoying now are somewhat in jeopardy that there's, there's going to be increased, mm -hmm. even in the best case. Yeah. And again, if I get, as I understand from Susan, some of the reason the current situation exists was that the school department, when they were in control of the building, were just in a holding pattern, and all they were looking to do was break even on the building and keep it in place until they determined what they, when they, you're using part of it for a while and you had tenants there, but it was just to sort of hold it in place until a final determination was made, so you really were only looking to break even on the building at the time, which is why it's changed around the way it is. And there is an odd rent structure that the nonprofits actually pay a different rent per square foot than the for-profits, and the building has roughly half and half. So that's um, whether that's fair or not. Each each entity has weighed in with me on that over the years. So. That may be where he picked up his fifteen percent rental adjustment was just to bring everybody to parity, and if in fact somebody else was doing. It. Um, if we move forward towards an RFP, is this ad hoc committee um, the entity that drafts that RFP that comes together with those? Could certainly come up with a recommend. Yeah, could certainly come up with a recommended RFP. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, though, um, you couldn't move forward with that until the city made the decision to surplus right. it and mm -hmm. say we're this. We consider this property surplus. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if we want to lease a space, we have to serve the city council has to declare it as surplus. Um, when we when we leased a few classrooms to Smith to up to Clark schools, we had the school committee had to declare it surplus mm -hmm. um, in order to execute the lease. So, um, but there's certainly no reason why this committee couldn't work on sort of the outlines or or the you know uh, what an RFP. So do, do clocks start ticking at any certain juncture here? For instance, once the city surplus is it? No, is there's it? no there's no clocks. I mean, there's no it, you know. I think I think the only clock we have is just that you know the we're going to be having a new fiscal year starting right. and, and the rents run until mm -hmm. July one. Yeah, the current lease is yeah. until June thirtieth. Yeah. So I think it would be just out of fairness to give people certain you know, an understanding about what's happening and give any groups out there would be good to. Think about doing this, um, you know, and we can certainly pull together examples of other RFPs and, and for a few, for a next meeting to look at to try to develop something. So this committee would rec make a recommendation to your office, and here's what we propose: if we propose, okay, it makes sense for the city to sell the building, but here it's the sort of thing we'd like you to put in the RFP based on the highest and best use analysis that seems to support the current use, could you include in the RFP our preference for live workspaces and small office rentals to nonprofits and artists and so forth? We'd like that to get yeah. consideration. <coughs> and then your office would put that together and then bring it to the council and say, you know, would you surplus it and let me put out an RFP on yeah, I mean, it, with, these, with what, these terms. What actually, and actually sometimes the surplus order itself may contain those elements um, that may contain, you know, I mean, the final punchline of the, of the 
order is typically, you know, and, then, and the council authorizes the mayor to, you know, s you know, sell and enter into a contract, et cetera, for the property. But that doesn't mean that as part of the surplusing, you know, like the roundhouse lot, one of the conditions was, you know, that the parking get replaced, that, there, that, that, that any parking that's taken away has to be replaced somehow. So there are those kinds of conditions can be put on it. So any, either way we do it. But I, so I mean, we could try to come up with a set of kind of principles of what would be in an RFP like this, mm -hmm. and and then have the committee approve them and endorse them. And that, but I do think ultimately there has to be some kind of an, an, a recommendation from this committee that says we think the building, because part of the charge of the committee was just to, to look at the building generally, mm -hmm. figure out is there some other city use for the building, and and then. You know, should should the city continue to own the building, or should it surplus it and go from there? So, was there someone in the audience that had their hand up? That, yes, please. Um, I know for a fact that some some of us would would really appreciate having a voice in being part of that discussion. If if we can, we'd like to have a couple representatives of the building to be part of that uh, building disposal. If if um, I don't know if it's just city council people that are. Well, we have the, the you know, the, that's the purpose of the reuse committee that's here, but it's a public meeting. And mm -hmm. my hope would be to run our next get together much like this with a, mm -hmm. rather than a, a hard, fast public comment, you can ask questions and make statements throughout the whole process just to feel included. What I might suggest we do is perhaps um, set our next meeting. And, and then let the mayor's office put together, based on our discussion, a sample of what they think the RFP would look like so we have a basis to start working on it and then distribute that prior to the meeting and then we'll all get together again and go over the, the more specifics of it now that we've analyzed the appraisal. Is that you comfortable with that? There's that? also part B, so what I want to say is, some of you may or may not know that, but the top floor of the Florence Community Center, is, is, except for one room, is completely full. So when I hear work, living space, but the bottom of the top floor is, except for one space again, and that may already be rented, I don't know. It's full, it's thriving, it's going. So being that we're in the building, we know what's going on, we certainly, I think we had, would have creative inputs and helpful inputs to give all of you. And Please, think, you're all welcome yeah. to come to our next get together. Mm -hmm. And my, my hope is that we, have the same kind of dialogue we had tonight between the committee members mm -hmm. and between the people in the public that are here to uh, participate in analyzing it. So are we are we comfortable with the, yes? It, no, so is there a certain point at which the city council uh, gets together and, and takes a vote to decide whether or not to surplus? I think what, right? we'll, and, and what timeline? Are we? This committee will make its recommendation to the mayor's office when yep. we're done, mm -hmm. and then the mayor's office will bring it to council at the appropriate time and put it on the agenda and say, as, as a council, we're going to discuss it, and there's public comment at those meetings, too, so sure. you can certainly come and, and tell the councilors what you think at the meeting where the councilors act on it. And that's likely to happen in what kind of time frame? Between now and June, I would think. I, I, yeah. I certainly wouldn't move forward with anything until the recommendations yeah. of this committee are finalized. I mean, yeah. that was the but it would be nice to know in, in coming up with next year's budget I mean, obviously, you know, the, it's going to have some bearing on the budget, but also uh, with an RFP, you put them out there. I mean, we put out the RFP for the appraisal, and that took a lot longer <laughs> yeah. than we thought it would, and this would take a lot longer than that because you need to give people time to do an analysis, to look at the building, to respond. So I don't, I don't sense that's going to, and then you're going to evaluate the, R, the, the, the results of the RFP, and then even if you pick a buyer, it takes a while to consummate the transaction. So. I imagine it's going to be a while, but it sure would be nice to get this committee's recommendation to the mayor and get the city council to move on that recommendation if they're going to before the end of the fiscal year in June. So procedurally, um, what would it take for us to be at a place where we're making a recommendation to serve the Are we at that? How does that happen? meeting we actually draft up mm -hmm. um, some language with our, the recommendations of this committee mm -hmm. and then uh, present it to the mayor and then the process. Mm -hmm. As we noted 
noted is, that, I mean, the reason I asked that question is you noted that even when the council votes is to surplus the property, doesn't that's why I was asking about a clock. It doesn't mean that that suddenly we're we're we have to start moving to selling. It's 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 just that it is the procedural point. I know that a lot of people are very concerned that that um, because everything's so tenuous, there's no clear understanding what the prospects are going to be. But the fact is, is that it doesn't mean it, it, it's going to be sold simply because we've surplus it. But it actually, it's a, it, for one thing, it's a bookkeeping process that allows them to put it in a different column. It is a surplus property is pending. It is able to be sold. It is not, it's not assured that it will be sold. We, the market dictates that for one, but the least of all, we also dictate the terms under, 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 under which it would be sold. Susan, you have Just two things. You know, the beauty of the RFP process is that you get to you get to value things other than the price. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the process of do, doing an RFP. It might be helpful to have this committee go, you know, get an introduction to the whole RFP process so that you can understand how you can you can give more points for something that's doing something that you want it to do and less points and you can take the emphasis off of the price and put more of the emphasis on the activity. That, that's why I was hoping we could get from, from your office a sample RFP based on the highest and best used in this and the discussion we've had here. Because a lot, I think, I for one would be a lot more comfortable agreeing to surplus the building if in fact the RFP put some emphasis on our concerns with regards to its future use. It's easier to let it go if our terms for letting it go or it's used in a way we want to see it used, uh, which would affect its value. But it, it's kind of, it probably makes more sense to have you all draft a do form RFP that reflects what we've talked about as a starting point for us to have that discussion. Well, I'm reluctant to have the RFP be driven specifically from the appraisal's recommendation because it's so specific. Um, coming up with broad criteria that this model in the uh, in the appraisal recommends would be more my feeling like we were doing it right, where we come up with broad criteria that we think is right for the city, right for the community, right for the building, viable, so it's not going to fall under in three years. And this model could be perfect, but I don't, we, we drill it down to that model in an RFP and that's all we've got. And if for some reason that doesn't come through, we're stuck with that RFP that's very well, specific. Yeah. And, and again, my interest in them doing is, is to give us a starting point, mm -hmm. and then we work, you know, we would, that's the thing we would discuss at our next meeting is, mm -hmm. is if, you know, what do we want to do with this proposed RFP? Do we want to add a different language? And mm -hmm. we can just deal with that the next time rather than the value. Again. Having said that, an RFP is not set in stone either. Mm -hmm. It can be modified later on. Because You've got to wait to see what you get. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in fact, you raised a question there. Where are we at surplusing this? Well, we're here. We've done an appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, we are serious about doing something with the building, whatever it may be. Um, but we do need to see something. And appraisals, or RFPs rather, are amended all the time. Um, this one out here for the hotel was amended, I don't know how many times. Uh, RFPs for the DPW building were amended. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, so, you never know. You know, some really bright individual could come in with a brilliant idea that we never thought of, and when we see that on paper, we might say, "Of course, this is a win-win for this building. Why would we consider this?" You know, it's a casino. One thing we have to be, I think, particularly sensitive to, though, is the cash flow of that building. I think one of the reasons that there are vacancies. I could have filled those in years past, but there were business there were businesses interested. But because we could only say I can only tell you this space is available for a year, I can't promise you two years, I can't promise you three. We lost a lot of potential tenants because they weren't going to move their business there and then not have it. And that mostly dealt with the first floor because the school department was kind of on the fence: are we going to use that first floor again for the high school or not? Um, but you know, we I think we need to be sensitive because businesses are evaluating their, their position in this building and should we lose tenants because of the um, uncertainty. uncertainty, the cash flow of that building could then become a drain on the city's budget. So whatever we do, I think we owe it to the to 
the tenants and ourselves to make the decisions quickly, as quickly as they can be made thoughtfully, but it's going to have an impact because people will leave the building if, if there's too much of it. During the interim, uh, the tenants should be sure that the fact that the city will continue to maintain and uphold the building in its current state and circumstances. So that, uh, it's not, that's the other thing. Once we decided surplus is something Not the state. I was going to say the state has yeah. set precedent in that yeah. respect. We, we will not do that. We, we are obliged to maintain the building in its current state. Are, uh, any other? I mean, at this point, I think we've kind of reached consensus. Your mayor's office will draft the. We'll RFP. obtain some information yeah. about that. Yeah, the RFP, and we'll meet again. So we meet again. The, we'll meet again the last Tuesday. The which is our normal finance committee fourth meeting. The fourth, the fourth Tuesday, yeah, that's true, there could be. February there are, but I bet in March there are. So the, the fourth Tuesday of February. 26th. Yeah, there's four. The 26th. Okay, yeah, so that's when we will just get together right. again. No, the committee. Absolutely. There's, <laughs> there's nothing else to do. Can we get any motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Thank you all.